we kick it off? Sure. So I really wonder what you guys are doing here at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but so welcome to Design pa Patterns with Kotlin Talk. Um, it's a almost full room. I assume the video doesn't show up the crowd, so <laughs> let's assume that way. Uh, who we are, we both work in Google, but first let me start with a disclaimer. Uh, we don't work in uh, Kotlin team, nor Android team. Our daily job doesn't involve anything related to Kotlin or Android, so these are all personal work, which we love to learn new languages, new platforms. So he came with the idea, actually, <laughs> on the lunch. Yeah. So, anything more to add? Uh, I'm John, this is Marat. <laughs> this may be helpful. <laughs> yeah, he does coffee, I do beer. Yeah. And this is the only picture I could find which only has both of us without any other people. So, we'll probably have a better picture next time yeah. we do this talk. <laughs> Good enough for this one, I guess. Yeah. So, design patterns. Um, First, let me start with this. If you're uh, very fluent with Kotlin and know design patterns very well, this talk might not be very interesting for you. But if you don't know or are a beginner at one of them, uh, you'll probably enjoy the talk. Let's start with design patterns. So what are design patterns? It's actually a confusing name because when I first heard it, it was like kind of something related to UI or design or something I should follow when I'm doing UI related work, which has nothing to do with that. I don't know why the name so sounding that way. But worst case, it makes you look cool, uh, smart, geeky. You can easily win uh, technical discussions. Oh, let's throw a singleton there and he's off. <laughs> so and another thing is if you have a design pattern book, it looks very good on your library, so you can take selfies, post it on Twitter. That's what I do on the weekend. And oh, he's doing design pattern stuff. He must be very cool, knowledgeable. But I think, like, also, it's it's very helpful for you know, kind of like when you're architecting uh, your service or, or kind of like building something. Um, these are kind of good shortcuts to like save you a lot of time and effort to like figuring out like, oh, how should I put this piece together that needs to, you know, have these abstract components that are getting built and yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's only if you really want to use the design pattern. You can still put the book there and pretend you know everything. So I, I really like this one. Uh, this is from Dijkstra. He says object-oriented programming is an exceptionally bad idea which could only have originated in California. Uh, probably this was about the same tiny timing where all the projects in C++ had a lot of issues and design patterns came out. Then we have the famous Gang of Four who kind of I think invented is not the right word, but kind of discovered design patterns. So according to the Gang of Four, who actually named the design patterns and first published the book, design patterns are descriptions of communicating objects and classes that are customized to solve a general design problem in a particular context. Which is, well, if you read the book, it's really not very easy to understand that the first, but uh, it's a very good book to uh, basically the Bible of Gang of uh, Design Patterns, I guess. So I, I really like this one. This is the first time I quoted myself. <laughs> this is from my Java ebook. I, I, I didn't really check the book's um, references if I took it from somewhere or came up with the idea or my co-author came up with the idea, but this is really a good description of design patterns. Design patterns are collective wisdom of and experience of many smart developers. They which unleash a huge great depth of experience that can be utilized to solve many common problems which that occur in software development. So basically they are existing uh, solutions to problems which would 
most probably appear in your projects at some time of the development. With that, uh, let's move to Kotlin. Sure. So, you want to um, take over? Yeah, I mean, so Kotlin is uh, you know a newer language. It's been around for a little while, but finally got to stable. Uh, was it a couple of years ago? Um, done by uh, JetBrains, the the company that does um, IntelliJ. They're sort of uh, leading the way. Um, it was recently brought in to, uh, like, to be fully natively supported on Android, um, which is interesting. Uh, it's statically typed. It runs on the JVM typically, but you can also compile it to JavaScript, um, so that like you can do sort of a full end-to-end uh, -end, like server, web front end, Android, all in the same language if you'd like. Um, and then uh, it's really nice, like when you're using it in Java, it's like completely interoperable with Java code. So you can pull in Java libraries very easily. Um, you can actually inter intermix uh, Java classes and Kotlin classes in the same package if you if you want to, and just you know sort of reference um, Java code and Kotlin very very easily, or you know vice versa. Um, and funny thing is, if you check Wikipedia, uh, it clearly says it's named after an island like Java. But the funny thing is, actually, Java is not named after an island. Well, it happens to be there's a name, uh, there's an island named Java, but it's really named after a coffee. <laughs> so. But espresso and coffee were taken, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it could have been like a latte or something. Cool. Missed opportunities. Then some tools. Uh, if you are using IntelliJ, uh, you may already uh, seen those, but if you go up to the menu, choose code, uh, there's an option to convert the selected Java files to Kotlin files. And if you just copy and paste, like if you copy Java, paste it into a .kt file, IntelliJ will just ask you if you'd like to convert it. Which is super nice. Yeah. And the next tool is, which was kind of more hidden, but it's, it also works very well. Uh, if you choose tools, go Kotlin, then uh, select show Kotlin bytecode. There's a new pane and it has the decompile option, which will decompile your Kotlin code to Java again. So we'll have a lot of fun with the uh, slides because we write the Java code, compile to Kotlin, then uh, write the Kotlin code, decompile to Java, so we'll see both ways. So let's go to Gang of Four Patterns with Kotlin. Yep, we're starting off with. So we'll, we'll basically uh, focus on the typical Gang of Four, classic Gang of Four Patterns. Uh, we'll not be covering any new or specific Kotlin or Android patterns this talk. But uh, we'll cover most of the uh, very commonly used Gang of Four Patterns. So right. let's start with singleton. So singletons uh, are uh, basically it's a single instantiation of an object. You have one instantiation um, throughout your code. It's like it's static. Uh, typically, you'll have a private constructor um, so that nothing else can instantiate it. And um, so it's it's a very uh, common um, thing that you'll want to do. Uh, some notes you want to make sure that it's thread safe. Um, and uh, it's, I don't know, there's not a whole lot to say about, about singletons, they're, they're pretty simple, right? So, um, so here's just a very basic example where we've got um, a static, a private static final instance um, which instantiates a new singleton object, the constructor's private, the default constructor's private. Um, and you know, another thing that you might wanna do is have like a final, like you might, want to make this a final class so that you can't extend it. Um, but the idea here is to just sort of like force users to use the one instance that you've already created and not create multiple of these things. Uh, so that if you've got like, you know, program wide, I mean, we've got a, a counter here, which probably should be like an atomic integer or something like that. But, um, you know, the idea is like anywhere in your code, you can reference this one sort of source of truth. And not have and not need to worry about there being multiples. Um, it should be thread safe so that you can use it across like whatever thread you're running on. Um, and the reason you're uh, instantiating the object at the uh, static uh, top level is to keep the thread safe. But it's not late loading right now, right? No. 
So we'll so fix it later. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is uh, like if you convert that, um, if you just like copy paste uh, that Java code into a Kotlin file, this is what it generates. Um, and so val is, so object um, actually is really all you need in terms of like creating the singleton part. Um, it automatically added this val instance equals singleton um, because in the Java version we had an instance variable. Uh, and val is basically like saying this is a final, um, this is final, so you can't change instance ever. Object, ins so uh, Kotlin has different, um, slightly different things from, from Java, so object is basically uh, saying that this is a single object instantiation. Um, you can have uh, companion objects to, um, to classes. So typically you'd have like a class uh, and then you might have a companion object that creates like some static things for that class. Um, and if you have it at the top level, it's a singleton. Uh, so basically this is what happens when we convert the right. Java code to Kotlin. Nothing other than we didn't do anything to make it, u make use of the uh, internal Kotlin stuff. Right, right. So we can see on the next slide, um, so I guess we don't have the, the actual. We'll so, have it later. Okay. <laughs> First. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll look at like another way to do this within the enum. Um, in Java, so instead of having the private static final thing, you've got just the single um, instance. Uh, and then, so that automatically instantiates it for you and everything. Um, basically does the same thing that. Uh, but it's thread safe, uh, reflection safe, and also lazy loading. So this is like the. Joshua Block way of writing the singleton, so we must follow this way. Sure. And if we just co uh, compile this to Kotlin. So we get an enum class in Kotlin um, with that instance as well. Uh, probably object would have been better though, I think. Yeah, again, this is like uh, not uh, speaking with an accent, <laughs> so it's really not the Kotlin way, but you're basically writing Kotlin with Java accent. Yep. Okay, so here's the native Kotlin, which just gets rid of that instance variable since it's not necessary. So now we've got um, just an object and then everything within that is sort of intended to be uh, applied to that, that single instance of this. Right, so it makes it a singleton. And then here's what it looks like decompiled. Um, so you end up something pretty close to, if not a little more verbose than, uh, than what we originally started with in Java. Yes? I'm a Kotlin guy, but uh, how do I get a reference for that and how is it supposed to go through it? Why can't I turn it into a... Um, because it's an object, so you, it just, you wouldn't call, so Kotlin you don't... Oh, not a class. Right, exactly. So yeah, object is a new keyword in Kotlin which kind of creates this bytecode. Yeah, and since, since uh, Kotlin's statically typed, like you'll get compiler. So when you put uh, the object, it automatically creates a private constructor and creates everything in the static block and it's basically a singleton which is thread safe, reflection safe and kind of works pretty well. I guess we are almost done with singleton. Yeah. I think we're gonna need to speed up though. <laughs> We've got a lot of these. So singletons are expensive. Uh, yeah, you don't wanna overuse them and you really wanna be careful about um, thread safety with these because like you can, you know, if you do things wrong, you can very easily have situations where like, you know, in all of these we showed an integer counter. Like that's one of those things that's probably not too thread safe. If you use like atomic int, that would be better. But like having a singleton can sort of, uh, surface these sorts of issues. Next, factory methods. So factory methods, uh, again we, uh, we start with uh, the typical gang of four description. It's basically for creating the objects and let the subclasses decide which class to instantiate. It's a creational pattern to address how to create objects. Uh, Basically, if you have different type of objects and different ways to uh, initialize them, or create them, you can just encapsulate and keep all the parts which are subject to change in one place. 
So let's move to a Java sample. Uh, this is a typical um, factory with two different German cars, seeming to share, uh, uh, sharing the same interface. And the factory method here, uh, depending on uh, which brand is asked for from the client, instantiates the objects and returns it. Pretty simple. And if we just convert it to Kotlin, actually I was very surprised because this was one of the few examples when the Kotlin code didn't compile uh, when it was converted from Java. So uh, the problem here was Kotlin uh, works different way with nulls. So uh, because we are returning null here, we need to add a question mark, which makes the return type optional. So basically, uh, Kotlin did a similar job. We have, the, we have two classes, same interface. Uh, we have kind of less code, uh, thanks to the uh, syntax of Kotlin. We have the switch again, and Kotlin decides which object to uh, create, which yeah. is very similar to the Java code. And just a note about the question mark there on, the, on car. Um, so that's called the Elvis operator mm -hmm. in Kotlin. And basically, um, in Kotlin, by default, uh, variables are not nullable. And so like, if you put car there without the question mark, it means that like, you must return an instantiated car object, null is not valid, um, which is why he got the compiler warning before, the compiler error before. And so now like, with that, it means that like, this is allowed to be nullable. Um, and the thing to kind of watch out for is like when you add that in, it means that like at the next level up, when you call rent a car, you actually have to expect a nullable version of car. So you have to have like car question mark and then you know level above that. So it's just you know something to kind of keep in mind as you're as you're working through this, or if you want to uh, deal with null pointer exceptions. So what is a uh, sorry, what's that? Fun is a function. So fun and means function. Yeah. Yep. And the uh, return type is at the end of the method signature. Right. So yeah, it's like uh, fun means function, and then rent a car is the name of the your method, and then um, this is the return type. If this were like, if this colon car were up above it, uh, car factory, it would be like inherits from or uh, implements. Um, so like it's a little overloaded. So the real change is if you must return null, uh, you can't just write it this way. You need to put the Elvis operator. And the same thing, um, I did a research, uh, uh, checked if we can write factory in a more efficient way. I come up with this solution, which is exactly the same thing, which we <laughs> converted from Java code. So uh, as far as we could find, factories are uh, much or less the same code which uh, you probably write in Java. So the good thing about factories is it's very easy to implement it's e and it easily encapsulates the object creation into one point which you can change at any time without breaking rest of the code. Uh, although factory method is enough most of the time, if things get complicated, uh, you will most likely switch to abstract factories. And uh, the ugly part is, which is true for all patterns, uh, if you don't need it, it will just complicate, make your code uh, more complicated and over-engineered and hard to maintain. So just make sure you need it. Next, abstract factories, which is like the, uh, more uh, complicated version of uh, factory method. So again, it will uh, have, uh, uh, it will encapsulate the object creation. This time, each class will have its own uh, factory. It's very similar to factory method. If you understand one, you can easily switch to other. And the interesting thing is, uh, this pattern is used uh, widely in JDK. I mean, um, documents, uh, other stuff. I mean, it's, it's really all over the JDK. So let's uh, switch to same example with the uh, additions which will make it abstract factory. We still have the same interface and same uh, classes. 
This time we have um, two factories for both concrete classes and one abstract factory uh, which will just uh, receive the uh, factory object and call the uh, method which uh, will create the object. If we convert this into Kotlin, um, again Kotlin does something we can, we would probably guess. Uh, the interesting part here is it uses the companion object again, which would make the static uh, single uh, class file uh, method call. So uh, it's much or less which you could guess after the previous example. However, if we try to write it in native Kotlin, things get interesting. We use reified and generics and the real interesting part is if we decompile this to Java. So in, uh, in this example, the bold part kind of shows you what Kotlin does. It uses an internal class called reflection, get or create Kotlin class to check the uh, variable and uh, create the right object for that class type. Yeah, I think that I found that once uh, you started getting more complex with the code that you were automatically converting back and forth, uh, the auto-converted stuff was less and less useful. Um, so like when I did uh, observers, like that was like was okay, but I had to do a lot of work to make it like actually compile. Yeah, but I mean, it was really interesting to see uh, what Kotlin will create to, in Java yeah. uh, to oh, yeah. make things work. and what actually it's doing it in the background. I really learned a lot, which wasn't really documented so visibly. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. So this is uh, one of the interesting, complicated Kotlin code, which is generate, uh, Java code, which is generated from Java. Yep. It should be 1.7 or 8. eight. Yep. Uh, I think that the default was 6. 6? Yeah. So, like, you have hmm. an option of which uh, JDK you're targeting um, when you're building it, and I think the default one was 1.6. I usually set it to something higher. That's why uh, we can check it after the talk, actually. For, I, I used this ID to uh, decompile this one, so we can make sure. But, yeah, the default is 1.6. So, again, the good, bad, ugly. Um, Abstract factories are really good most of the time. If you, again, need it, it really organizes well and very type safe. Uh, the bad thing is it will introduce more classes than um, factory methods. So, again, if you don't need the abstract factory and fine with the factory method, just go with it. Next, the builder. All right. Let's talk about the builder. Um, so. Builders are nice when you have like objects you want to instantiate that have kind of complex um, constructors. So you have like a constructor with maybe like several optional things, or um, or you want to help uh, people when they're instantiating. You've got like say um, a constructor that has ten integers that that need to be passed. Um, it can be it can get confusing when you're just like passing a bunch of uh, parameters that are all identical to each other, and so like. Um, builders are kind of nice things to use. Basically, it replaces the constructor with um, another class that sort of defines how you're going to put this uh, together and then instantiates it all um, at the end for you. And so this is like kind of a very typical builder example. Um, so you've got on the, on the left side of the screen is uh, the class that you're trying to instantiate, uh, which is person. So person has name and surname. Um, and another thing that you can do is, is see here we've got private for, for those, but you can also have them final so that uh, you can have um, kind of an extra level of safety on uh, the members of the class that you're creating so that like when you, uh, when you use your builder, you can set all that stuff initially and then pass it through the constructor and have everything uh, ready to go instead of, um, and, and have your builder be setting those values throughout your code. Uh, but here, basically, like we're just going to have a builder, which um, you can have one method for set name, one method for set surname, and then build, and then it's going to put your person together with those, with those values. 
one thing to add, if you're new to the design patterns, um, you usually u don't use builder with two fields. Uh, it's more like complex objects, which you have a lot of properties, but we need to keep it short to fit in the slides. Yeah. Um, so here's here's it converted to Kotlin uh, auto converted. So um, it looks very very similar. Uh, I don't know that there's really a whole lot to say on this. I mean, here's um, something interesting. This is basically like if you have a nullable field, you can use the bang bang to uh, say like this will never be null. Um, it's basically just like casting it to a non-nullable type. Uh, in it um, is similar to static. Uh, it'll just run when the, um, when the thing gets built. And this is the funny part. I mean, yeah. this was probably the <laughs> most efficient code when you write the native Kotlin version, right? Right. So um, I kind of uh, I specified here. So like val. Um, means that these are final values once it gets uh, instantiated here. We've got um, the second uh, parameter is optional. So we, we'll have a equals null is the, um, is the possible, like if you only specify one argument, the second one will automatically be null, um, but it'll require the first one. So this is a way that you can have um, a constructor that uh, sort of forces you to have like, okay, these things are at least required, and then we'll have like default values for uh, for the stuff that's not required. Um, and both of them are final, so. And then that generates all of this. Um, that one line. <laughs> yeah, so since we had the, uh, the question mark at the end, so we've got like nullable annotations on a bunch of this stuff um, that Kotlin adds in there for you. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, just keep moving. Um, so basically, like, this is, uh, this is nice that you can just replace this with optional parameters. Um, you can cut down quite a bit of code if, if it's not, if it's not really needed, uh, and, and still have something that's, um, very clear and concise. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you might still need to, um, once you get more complicated constructors and more complicated combinations of things where um, you may not have sort of clean defaults, then you might still actually need to implement something like the builder pattern in Kotlin. Let's speed up and move to structural patterns. Am I doing this one? Okay, yeah, so. you do this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, facades, um, basically uh, facade is, where you have, you're trying to provide an API and you want to limit um, the external surface of what you're providing and then sort of encapsulate all the complexity on your end. Um, so here's, here's an example. So we've got uh, several private methods here um, that kind of do some amount of work uh, Which is we've got super, super prone to exceptions, so don't do this at home. We are professionals. Yeah. That's how we handle this. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is just for an example slide. <laughs> and then you've got like one method that's, that's going to be like tying everything together. Um, and so that's the general idea. Like when you're providing an API, you're probably going to want to have like some very typical cases that you're exposing. And then like handling all of the back end work yourself. You don't want to expose all of your you know, all the manual work that you're doing to, to, the, to your end user. Um, and then here it is in, in Kotlin. Uh, so it looks very, very similar to, um, to the Java. We just have uh, private, um, private function definitions there. And then here it is implemented in Kotlin. Wait, it's, is this shorter? No, just it's the font a size. It's different font size. <laughs> so it's so basically the same thing. Um, so, like this is probably something that you'll want to do in general, uh, and but don't overuse it. And yeah, it's pattern. also a anti pattern, mostly done in Java E. It's called the spaghetti code, uh, not spaghetti, lasagna code, which creates additional layers and like <sighs> it's unnecessary calls. 
Next, the decorator. So uh, decorators are really fun. I, I, I really love decorators. I might be overusing them most of the time. Uh, basically, decorator is a wrapper which wraps the object and adds additional function, uh, functionalities. It's really super, super uh, powerful and extensible because basically it can change the behavior on the runtime. Let's see an example. Uh, so we have a pizza example, a base pizza, and we have some toppings. So how we use this, we create the base pizza, then uh, each topping will uh, encapsulate, will wrap the pizza, and each time when the uh, creator or the caller uh, calls make pizza, the wrapper class is responsible for adding its own behavior and calling the make pizza uh, in the uh, enclosing class. So you can add unlimited number of um, uh, decorators because basically we have a pizza variable in each object. So, uh, and they share the same interface. So you can wrap uh, as much as we want. If we convert this to Kotlin, again, it's much or less something we would expect. Uh, again, thanks to uh, uh, the uh, syntax, we don't need the uh, getter, setters, and other stuff. And as you can see, the Kotlin version is same. This time, the font size is same, so we are not fooling anyone. Uh, basically, it doesn't add something very special, but it's still much less code because uh, you don't need to declare the uh, uh, properties inside and you can use the um, Kotlin style uh, constructors and everything. So the good, bad, ugly, oh, you can't make me say anything bad about decorators. So <laughs> unlike inheritance, it's very easy to change the behavior uh, without breaking the existing code. Uh, actually, I have a long story about this where I really messed up a design and saved everything with decorators, that's why it's my favorite, but I won't go to, into detail since we don't have time. However, it, the overuse may uh, introduce some uh, complicated execution flow, uh, especially if someone is just coming to your project uh, in a later stage. So again, just use it if you want. Next, adapter. So adapter, uh, converts the interface of a class into another interface the client expects. It mostly solves problem with solving lega uh, working with legacy code or uh, working lega uh, making legacy objects work with uh, newer code. It's uh, very easy to implement and uh, introduce by refactoring your code. And uh, basically it's uh, based on uh, delegation and wrapper. Let's see the code. So we all have this interesting problem of uh, uh, different voltages and plug types. So we have the interfaces of US plug, EU plug, and the implementations. So what we want to do is we want to create an adapter which will let our US plug work in EU plug. So what we do here is we basically implement the uh, method which would adapt the two objects and just uh, lower the voltage. So this is a basic, simple Java example. When we convert this to Kotlin, again, we'll see a little less code and something not really unexpected. And uh, we don't have anything special in Kotlin to uh, make it shorter or nicer or anything. So uh, basically we don't have anything unexpected and if we decompile this back, we will get the exact same Java code. Uh, yes, that's the Kotlin way of uh, creating classes. You can just uh, put the uh, 
constructor uh, properties there and Kotlin actually. Uh, if you decompile this back, you will see something like this. Kotlin creates all the properties inside the class, constructors and whatever else needed. Right, it's also Kotlin's way of specifying the default constructor. You can have actually multiple yeah. constructors defined, um, just like in Java. Uh, but the one that's up next to at the kind of class level line is the default. Cool. We have behavioral patterns and uh, 20 more minutes, I guess. All right. This is um, mine or yours? I don't remember. So, uh, strategy pattern. Um, this is. Uh, the image is yours. The image is mine. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember who we were going to say. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know, it's actually pretty similar to uh, some other things. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually, <laughs> I'm not sure if we can really say it's a pattern. It's definitely a pattern, but uh, it's something very simple and every one of you do it all the time. You create one interface right. and uh, same objects sharing the same interface which can interchange uh, and the client can choose which behavior it wants to uh, perform. So strategy is basically like use interfaces correctly. Yeah, yeah. instead of concrete implementations. Yes, right. So it's a very basic pattern which basically forms most and other patterns, I guess. I mean, I think like command is actually also almost identical to this in mm -hmm. terms of uh, what we say the, the pattern is. Um, and since it's this simple, you don't expect anything very different when yeah, you're converted to Kotlin. There's like some very small amount of syntactic sugar, but it's almost the same. Um, so, and we'll look at uh, the command pattern, uh, which again is is very very similar to uh, to the previous one. Um, since it's again kind of mostly talking about like uh, sort of shared. Um, expectations across uh, different implementations. So it's basically, again, like use, um, use interfaces or maybe abstract classes. Um, but here uh, we just have something that like, you wanna have, um, say this like execute command that uh, you have available across like multiple different things. Like you, you might implement this a dozen times with different things. Uh, another example was actually like the logger example that Marat had from the previous one, or um, an additional one would be like, if you had a, some, like a click event, for example, and then you wanted to grab um, uh, some piece of uh, data off the click event to uh, determine like, you know, how you're gonna save your file, and instead of having like if else, if else, if else, um, you know, if it's like this thing, then run this method dot, or this class dot execute, or if it's this other thing, run a different class dot execute. Um, this way you just have like an interface that uh, would correspond to that, um, that member, and then you could just run like that dot execute, and then whatever class it is, uh, you'll have it covered. Um, but yeah, this one's uh, very simple. Again, like between Java and Kotlin, it's, not uh, much. Not a whole lot of difference yeah. there. Yeah. And if you write it in native Kotlin, again, it's not like huge difference, I guess. I, I think that I was able to delete some, some curly braces. Cool. <laughs> I'm glad you're not paid with the lines of code you write. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is like a little interesting. It kind of throws in these like additional uh, variables and, and things like that. Um, I'm trying to remember if this was one of the ones that uh, was not compilable when I, when I converted it. Once in a while when you like, kind of go back and forth, um, actually when you do the, like, the decompiled Kotlin, it'll give you a bunch of different classes that you have to like, kind of break out separately. There's like, a lot of uh, metadata associated that um, like actual Java doesn't like. Um, so, yeah, I couldn't come up with like really too much negative here. Just inc you're going to end up with a few more classes because of the um, the interfaces, uh, or a few more files because of the interfaces. Um, and if you really like switch statements, like 
<laughs> Sorry. Okay, three more minutes. Observer. Uh, okay. So observers um, are a pattern where you sort of uh, register against um, kind of a central thing that keeps track and will notify uh, the things that have registered to it for like some change. Um, so it's like a, a pub, a pub sub model, basically. Um, and, and both Java, Java E has some out of box solution as well as a lot of third libraries which kind of covers the problem. Yeah, yeah. they're pretty easy to write from scratch. Yep. Yep. Um, so, so this typical Java example. Yeah, and so here we're actually just using the uh, Java observer. Um, and so you've got like observer, observable is the thing that you're, uh, that you're watching and then um, when you're adding something, you're gonna notify the observers and then this is gonna just like, uh, the dot update um, will update the thing and call back to, uh, to your observer. Wow, much less code. Yeah, this one's a little bit better. Um, I think there was one interesting thing when we, when I did the, uh, so when I did my implementation, um, notify observers didn't actually have any parameters because like uh, the, the observer class um, would pull uh, off of the observable item itself. Um, and if you don't specify, so in Java, notify observers actually doesn't require any parameters. Um, and then it just calls the, uh, the next version with a null parameter um, that's overloaded in the, in the Java implementation of this. Um, but in Kotlin, there's a bug where if you don't include that, it doesn't compile. Or it, it compiles, but it doesn't run. That was probably the second example we couldn't just convert to Kotlin and make it work. Well, it, bugs. it was <laughs> also interesting because it, like, it ran, but it would never uh, call back to the observer. Um, and if we want to write the observer in Kotlin way, uh, we use delegates, uh, which we don't have time to dig in, but I will uh, really, um, I mean, you, 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 you would really like to go and look at it from the Kotlin document, if uh, the docs from, if uh, you're interested in that. Uh, it works pretty, pretty well. And it basically creates this Java bytecode, which is like uh, pretty, pretty complicated and it's doing a lot of stuff in the background. And of course, we have the Rx Java. Um, I'll just speed it up since we are all already out of time. So uh, writing Rx Java in Kotlin is much or less the same. Uh, you just change the syntax a bit and it works. It's like a little less uh, boilerplate code, I guess. And the comp decompiled version is much or less the same Java code. Observers are mostly good. <laughs> They're mostly good. They, uh, you don't want to overuse it. You can yeah. get complicated and slow down things. And well. I'll just go over this slide fast and finish it up. Uh, so dependency injection is a very, very uh, famous one, which we mostly always work without even noticing because we use the existing frameworks like CDI, Spring, Play, or Dagger, uh, if you're an Android developer especially. So this is a basic uh, naive Java version. And basically this is the strategy pattern. The real difference is who and how uh, it's decided to uh, inject this logger here. So if the client doesn't aware of which logger it's using. It's basically dependency injection because some other force or class or whatever injects the real logger into this point. And if we convert it to Kotlin, it's again much or less something expected. The real fun starts with Dagger. I won't go much into Dagger, but we have module provides, which is the providing uh, dependencies inject, which is requesting dependencies, and component, which breeds both uh, together. So this is a very simple Dagger code from Dagger website. If you like it, 
go to the Dagger site, you will say, find the same example and you will see in much more detail. Here we have the module which provides the heater and pump, uh, the coffee maker which needs those resources and the component interface which binds them together. So module X as a factory, component binds the uh, both two. So if we convert this to uh, coupling, uh, it's, it's again much or less the same code, nothing really interesting. And I think this concludes the talk. So the takeaway is design patterns are very cool and use it as much if you need it. As like everything, overuse and unnecessary use might be really harmful. And with Kotlin, it's less code, uh, less parentheses and curly braces. It's usually syntactic sugaring, but it's easier to write. And for me, I mean, Java to Kotlin tool works almost near perfect. We only had two issues, one with your observer and the other was uh, the null return type, which is actually expected. It's not a tool's problem. Anything more to add? Um, not really, any questions? Oh, we are already four minutes over, so thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks.